I think there's a confusion because life emerges in chemistry that life is chemical. I don't think life is chemical. I think life emerges in chemistry because chemistry is the first thing the universe builds where it cannot exhaust all the possibilities because the combinatorial space of chemistry is too large. Well, but is it possible to have a life that is not a chemical system? Yes. Well, uh, there's a guy I know named Lee Cronin who's been on a podcast a couple of times who just got really I pissed off listening to this. <laughs> he probably just got really pissed off hearing that. Uh, for people who somehow don't know he's a chemist. Yeah, but he would agree with that statement. Would he? I don't I think, think he would. I don't think he would. He would broaden the definition of chemistry until it would include everything. Oh, sure. Okay, so you Or maybe, I don't know. But wait, but you said that universe that's the first thing it creates is chemistry. Where the, very precisely, it's not the first thing it creates. Obviously, like, it has to make atoms first. But it's the first thing. Like, if you think about, you know, the universe originated, uh, atoms were made in, you know, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, and then later in stars, and then planets formed, and planets become engines of chemistry. They start exploring what kind of chemistry is possible. And the combinatorial space of chemistry is so large that even on every planet in the entire universe, you will never express every possible molecule. Um, I I like this example, actually, that, that Lee gave me, which is to think about Taxol. It has a molecular weight of about 853. It's got, you know, a lot of atoms, but it's not astronomically large. And if you try to make um, one molecule uh, with that molecular formula and every three-dimensional shape you could make with that molecular formula, it would fill 1.5 universes in volume. So the, with one unique molecule, mm -hmm. that's just one molecule. So chemical space is huge. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that because if you want to ask a question of why does life emerge in chemistry? Well, life emerges in chemistry because life is the physics of how the universe selects what gets to exist. Um, and those things get created along historically contingent pathways and memory and all the other stuff that we can talk about um, but the universe has to actually make historically contingent choices in chemistry because it can't exhaust all possible molecules. What kind of things can you create that's outside the, the combinatorial space of chemistry? That's well, what I'm trying to understand. Oh, so. if it's not chemical. So I think some of the things that have evolved on our biosphere, I would call as much alive as chemistry, as a cell, um, but they seem much more abstract. So for example, I think language is alive. I think, um, or at least life. Um, I think memes are, I think. You're saying language is life. Yes. Language is alive. Oh boy. We're going to have to explore that one. <laughs> okay. But life, maybe not, maybe not alive, but I don't, I actually don't know where I stand exactly on that. Um, I've been thinking about that a little bit more lately, but mathematics too. Um, and it's interesting because people think that math has this platonic reality that exists outside of our universe. And I think it's a feature of our biosphere and it's telling us something about the structure of ourselves. Um, and I find that really interesting because when you would sort of internalize all of these things that we notice about the world and you start asking, well, what do these look like if I was, you know, something outside of myself observing these systems that we're all embedded in, what would that structure look like? And I think we look really different than the way that we talk about what we look like to each other. What do you think a living organism in math is? Is it one axiomatic system or is it individual theorems or is it? I think it's the of... fact that it's um, open-ended in some sense. It's, it's another open-ended uh, combinatorial space and the recursive properties of it allow creativity to happen, uh, which is what you see with, you know, like the revolution in the last century with Gödel's theorem and Turing. And, you know, there's there's clear places where mathematics notices holes in the universe. <laughs> so it seems like you're sneaking up on a different kind of definition of life, open-ended, large combinatorial space. Yeah. Room for creativity. Definitely not chemical. I mean, chemistry is one substrate. to chemical. Yeah. Chemical. Okay, what about the third thing, which I think will be the the hardest because you probably like it the most, is evolution or selection? Well, specifically, it's Darwinian evolution. Darwinian, okay. And I think Darwinian evolution is a problem. But the reason that that definition is a problem is not because evolution is in the definition, because, but because the implication is that 
you know, that pe- most people would want to make is that an individual is alive. And the evolutionary process, at least the Darwinian evolutionary process, most evolutionary processes, they don't happen um, at the level of individuals. They happen at the level of populations. So again, you would be saying something like what we saw with the self-sustaining definition, which is that populations are alive, but individuals aren't because populations evolve and individuals don't. And obviously, like maybe you're alive because, you know, your gut microbiome is evolving, but Lex as an entity right now is not evolving by canonical theories of evolution. In assembly theory, which is attempting to explain life, evolution is a much broader thing. So so an, an individual organism can evolve under assembly theory? Yes. You're constructing yourself all the time. Assembly theory is about construction and how the universe selects for things to exist. What if you reformulate everything like a population is a living organism? So That's fine too. Right. But, but this again gets back to, so, um, so I think what all of the, you know, like we can nitpick at definitions. I don't think it's like incredibly helpful to do it, but the reason for, for it's me. It's fun. Yeah, it is fun. It is really fun. And actually I do, <laughs> I do think it's useful in the sense that when you see the way, the ways that they all break down, um, you either have to keep forcing in your like sort of conception of life you want to have, or you have to say all these definitions are breaking down for a reason. Maybe I should ad- adopt a more expansive definition that encompasses all the things that I think and are life. And so for me, I think life is the process of how information structures matter over time and space. And an, an example of life is what emerges on a planet and yields an open-ended cascade of generation of structure and increasing complexity. And this is the thing that life is. And any individual is just a particular instance of these lineages that are, you know, structured across time. Um, And so we focus so much on these individuals that are these short temporal moments in this larger causal structure that actually is the life on our planet. Um, And I think that's why these definitions break down because they're not general enough, they're not universal enough, they're not deep enough, they're not abstract enough to actually capture that regularity. Because we're focused on those, that little ephemeral thing that yeah, we call it's like human life. Aristotle focusing on, you know, heavy things falling because they're earth-like and, you know, things floating because <laughs> they're air-like. It's the wrong thing to focus on.